And so it's just like very prayerful work. Most of my prayers every day are, God, please help, help me see clearly and help me articulate in such a way that's sufficiently foreign to modern reductive ears that they're enchanted again back into seeing that the reality we can see and touch is not all there is. On In Good Faith, we believe that all faith traditions have something to teach us about how God is working in the world and in our lives. So join us as we listen and learn. Today on In Good Faith, we're speaking with the editor-in-chief of Comment, which is a public theology magazine. What the heck is public theology? I thought we didn't do that. I thought that was kept in our individual churches, but no, it's it needs to spill out. And we'll talk about that today with Anne. I'm in studio with senior producer Heather Bigley. Hello. Also with producer Leah King. Hi, Steve. First of all, we're going to get a definition of what is public theology. And she's got a great phrase that I hang on to. We'll talk about that at the end. But also the idea that there are some churches that have no windows. And she's speaking metaphorically, that we should be able to see out from our congregations into the community. So what does a church congregation do in conjunction with, let's say, the local police force that will come up and other secular organizations? Can we really do that? Yeah. I think another thing that's fascinating about this interview is Ann Snyder herself does not come from an American Christian context. She experienced Christianity in South America uh, and grew up in in, outside of the U.S. And so she really does help us understand, I think, an age-long debate in religion. What is the spiritual goodness and what is just a cultural hanger-on? Yeah, she comes up with what she called her Christianity becoming a transcendent universal thing. So we've got lots to learn about that. And I started by asking her Kind of the dilemma that we see in current times of people distrusting institutions, whether governmental or religious. In some of our largest historically morally authoritative institutions, be they the office of the president or the Catholic Church or large Protestant denominations, any large entity, but then also kind of more covenant, what you might call covenantal institutions like marriage and family, there is just both a individual sense that has developed generationally that we don't quite know how to attach and stay attached. We don't know how to stay committed. Commitment is an affront to some degree to the nature of change in reality and over a lifespan. Mm. It's also an affront to our own sense of agency and discernment. You know, a lot of people have said, look, I've had it. If an institution is here to just prop up a leader who is invariably fallen and self-centered or whatever, then I'll have no more. Yeah. And, and then I do think there's also just a bit of a natural thing where institutions by their very nature are a bit sclerotic, whether you're talking about something like the State Department or something very kind of steeled and hierarchical like the Catholic Church. Sort of such scaffoldings and structures don't work very seamlessly with the pace of change and a more fluid global technological era. So I think they're just often also perceived as slow and somehow not interacting with the way most of us are trying to keep up with time and like mass complexity. So there's just something almost in the puzzle piece fitting of how all of us are trying to survive late modernity and institutions who are no longer able to protect us from that, let alone themselves figure out how to reinvent themselves to still be bearers of tradition that has a renewing bent and is not just stuck. We look at institutions and we're like, they're not related. Yeah, they're somehow yeah. like not speaking to my Monday to Friday. So that's really interesting to hear you say, in one case, a lot of it is just the result of human frailty. People have failed in their trust for what they were uh, appointed or elected to do or chose to do. Also, this is really intriguing to me, what you say about the speed of our, our modern communication and that it lags in institutions that often are still printing out forms and hauling things from one office to another for eight signatures or whatever it might be, the pace of communication and change. And yet, you could point to each of these institutions and point to great good that was done that could not have been accomplished individually without an institution or a collective right. effort. Because you do what you do, I think you must have hope. 
for institutions and people. I do. I mean, I think we're in such a, again, a quick age that's also obsessed with like immediate results Mm -hmm. and visibility. And institutions at their best, I like to think of them as supporting the background architecture for agile entrepreneurialism, redemptive responses to human pain to occur. So just as an example, yesterday I happened to be, I'm in Chicago, as I say, and I, while I'm here, I'm have the great joy of reporting on a longstanding kind of collective impact effort who are, have been trying to address very concerning upticks in gun violence throughout the city of Chicago. And it formally started in 2016. It's now called Together Chicago. They formalize into an actual nonprofit with quite a substantive staff. But I was joining them yesterday for a staff meeting, and it was interesting talking to, it was very, I would say it was like probably 75% African American and representing most of the neighborhoods throughout the city, some of which obviously are much more afflicted by even just several mass shootings over the weekend. And A, it was beautiful to see this sort of cross sector collaboration happening in this case, then really united out of a sense of hope and prayerful expectation that churches have a role to play, faith-filled police officers have a role to play, and the broader social and civic weave that they have formed to try to defeat a plague on the city right? that is ruining lives and leaving families devastated. I was like, this to me is like institutions at their best. They're not out in front. They shouldn't need to be out in front. They are meant to be formative, and they need to accept the quiet power that they have in that potent sort of seedbed stage of either developing a human being's thinking and posture or sowing an initial community that can yield social change. And I think if we all saw institutions less as just sort of serving our own needs or needing to yield a linear path towards some public impact tomorrow and instead (laughs) saw them as in the decades-long, transgenerational long business, we might all just rest a little easier and then have a little more energy to put our own elbows into trying to renew them and try to continue to shape the character of them to serve 21st century complexity. And so when you talk about public theology and how that can be good for a society, what do you mean exactly by public theology? Since people might have all different actual individual faiths, but theology is a look at God, a viewpoint at least. I should probably come up with a really comprehensive definition of public theology, but the way I understand it in short is I define public theology as the study of God done by and or for the public, and as it kind of pertains to issues in the public square. Like why we might care about our fellow community members, that type of thing? Yeah, yeah. Any issue that is roiling our common life, or increasingly Ah. in the U.S., not so common life. So whether it's trying to understand what does make people so distrustful, what are the hot issues that seem to lead to so much fracture, and why is that? Like, are these fundamental differences? In our particular case, I mean, Comment tries to be a journal that is open. We bring in all truth as God's truth, freedom, and sort of delight to the work, but we are rooted in what we call 2,000 years of Christian social thought from the various streams. And that's considered a living tradition and a living dialogue. And we try to bring that as light to the reigning challenges, anxieties, and longings of the day. We obviously live in a very fractured, fairly disintegrating age. It's Even for me, it's become harder and more unnerving to try to assess what any kind of a shared actual reality is for a whole society, for a whole nation, in our case, a continent. How do we both look as clearly as possible on realities that are kind of eight miles deep that might be resonant with people's zeitgeist and illuminate those and sort of see like, okay, how is God, how is the Holy Spirit in particular moving in that reality that we're trying to paint? And then how, if we believe God is redemptive and alive, in what ways is he actively partnering with people and organizations and norms Somehow, like, what's that mysterious process to not give up on a redemptive co-laboring with God? So that's kind of how I approach public theology. More recently, I've been borrowing the language of Christian humanism, which is a whole separate podcast episode in itself. But I sort of view a lot of our work as building on a 2,000-year-old tradition that we would date to, like, the hours before Christ died. And it's sort of a theological project, a virtue formation project, a civic and political economy project, and an aesthetic project. 
So all of that is kind of wrapped into how we understand public theology. I find in our time that we actually have a lot of, interestingly, a lot of secular sort of eavesdroppers or eaves readers, as I call them, who I think are just so exhausted by an overly partisan media landscape. They want to feel more human and they want to understand how to rehumanize the context in which they're living. And so they read us and they're intrigued by the phrase public theology because we don't live in like the 40s. They don't quite know what it means anymore, but they sense like, okay, I don't know what I am. I think I'm spiritual. You guys seem to be like charting out new wineskins for a spiritually hungry age. Mm. It's been interesting to me that the phrase has not been a barrier, even if it's not, you know, explainable in a soundbite. At least it's the way I'm trying to inhabit it in our work is not easily explained in a soundbite. You're listening to In Good Faith. We'll be back with more in just a moment. I'm Stephen Cap Perry, host of the In Good Faith podcast, and I want to tell you about another in our family of BYU radio podcasts, an award-winning show with an award-winning host. This is Julie Rose on Top of Mind. Do you get turned off by the news because of how angry and polarizing and even depressing it can be? Doesn't anybody know how to have a civil conversation or way to competing ideas without a knee-jerk reaction that if you don't think what I think, you're a bad person? Check out the podcast, Top of Mind. They take one tough topic and they dive deep. And the goal is learning how to stay open and curious, even when you're confronted with different perspectives that may challenge us. Learning how to stick with the discomfort until we feel like we've actually learned and gotten some understanding. We may change our minds, we may not, but every episode will leave you feeling hopeful and empowered to become a better advocate for what does matter to you. Top of mind, listen to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to In Good Faith. We're speaking with Ann Snyder about today's Christian landscape. So the magazine has been around since 1983, but actually seems as crucial or more crucial now than perhaps any time since its founding. How do you keep up with the speed of change? Or or is that even possible? (laughs) Do you just have to look for principles? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, it's very overwhelming some days, and I'm more and more aware of how limited I am. Both limited, of course, in ability, but also limited in purview and limited in calling. I think I I have a particular, you could call it an obsession or <laughs> um, care for the question, like, what is a human being? What is a person in our time? Because that just feels uniquely threatened to me right now on a variety of fronts, whether we're talking about end-of-life issues or AI or the future of work, how isolated people are, not enmeshed in loving relationships sufficiently. I feel like the story of modernity and, frankly, the story of Christians in modernity, especially in like the West, is obsessed with, we are in times of crisis, we are in times of crisis, we are in times of like the juncture of the next era. But I do think that in our own context, again, in the U.S. alone, we are in a moment of like profound spiritual hunger, huge disenchantment with organized religion. I've become a lot more sympathetic to like the spiritual but not religious crowd that are like groping for faith expressions that seem believable and God breaking in, but also want to see that playing out outside of the halls of churches that seem to lack windows, like that seem to be just for themselves and the saving of their own peoples. I wonder if you could tell me, if we could back up though to a little bit of personal theology, just what kind of faith background did you come from or training? And then what did you, what was that process of claiming that for your own as you grew up? I grew up overseas inside of a Christian family. My grandparents were Bible translators with an organization called Wycliffe, which kind of flowered in the 1930s and 40s. So they served in Peru, South America, in the jungle for many decades. My mother grew up there with her siblings amidst Quechua indigenous tribal kids. And so I was exposed to Christianity as a kid very much as a beautiful, transcendent, 
force and truth that incarnated in very particular ways in different contexts. So I actually really wasn't that it has, I, I have had to study as an adult Christianity as it expresses itself in the West and then more peculiarly in the American context. Mm. Um, but growing up, I didn't actually understand Christianity as a Western thing. I understood it as a transcendent universal thing that I was most familiar with this expression in the context of Southern Hemisphere, more indigenous caste. Yeah. And so in some ways, sort of pre-modern, actually. So fast forward, I wound up back in the U.S. living in New England, which is a little like the Pacific Northwest, very secular. And I went to an, kind of an aggressively secular high school. And within that context, I was part of just a classic youth group retreat mm. thing that I chose to go to and heard the gospel message in a way that was like every sort of supernatural signal you always hear, like the tingling of the heart and the com compelling to rise up and say, yes, I want to devote my life to you. I think you are Lord. And I and I've got exposed to this like very real, very real call towards a Christ-like love, both for me and for the world. Mm. So that happened outside of my high school. I returned to that high school feeling at once, like everything was enchanted and everyone was connected and everyone had a soul, yet feeling quite alienated religiously suddenly back in this school context. So that led me to be curious about the school that I wound up going to for college called Wheaton, which is West of Chicago, Christian liberal arts school. Mm. And they have this mantra, not just for Christ and his kingdom, but the, uh, the other one is the integration of faith and learning. And I, at the time, had stumbled upon a very famous religious historical book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. And I didn't know much about evangelicals, but I was very intrigued by the author Mark Knoll's description of what a Christian mind was. And it was so foreign to what I had understood in my fledgling Bible study path alongside pretty rigorous intellectual learning in high school. And I was like, what would it be to combine these two things? What does that even mean? Yeah. So out of intrigue, I chose Wheaton. And it was there that I was, though it is a predominantly Protestant school, it was there that I was suddenly exposed to all these different theological traditions within 2,000 years of Christian social thought, you know, Catholic, Reformed, Anabaptist, Pentecostal, all of that. I was just like fascinated by how these different tributaries of thought that often emerge out of very distinct histories and cultures geographically in the world, how they then manifested or didn't in public currents of, of times of crisis within a given civilization, in times of global tumult, I was always interested in like, when does Christianity make itself of service to a moment in a way we can look back on and say, okay, maybe you weren't the only hero of the story, but something in your fragrance of thought made a difference to a society yeah. surviving or not surviving to human flourishing, et cetera. So that kind of followed me. And then there's a lot more I could say. I discovered Dorothy Day. I've, I sort of have trended more Catholic as I've gotten older, but I haven't fully crossed the Tiber. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how working on comment influences your faith life, and then how does your faith life influence your work on comment? Can you separate those or see how they bleed into each other, influence each other? To be honest, working for a magazine that is animated by 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years of conversation and dialogue specific to the cross is like the axis mundi. The cross is the thing that like shifts history. And to be reading and interacting with so many thinkers and doers and saints from the Catholic, Eastern, Reform, like all these different traditions in my day job, and then getting to talk to kindred spirits about all that, it makes um, <laughs> finding a church harder. There's something about, there's something like deeply fulfilling about finding a community on mission in my work right now, mm. both through colleagues, writers, practitioners we get to feature that I get to highlight and hopefully connect to other kindred spirits and sort of various forms of redemptive work. There's something about being enmeshed in that Monday through Saturday, really, that is glorious. And then Sunday comes and I feel like dissatisfied with church life itself right now. So that's an honest comment. But, you know, this work is hard. I feel yeah. like very much a steward of trying to help we're not trying to tell people what to think. We're trying to give them a reliable context within which to think and within which to continue to keep at trying to sow common ground and common good, whether they're in education or healthcare or policing or running a business or or actually working inside the church, et cetera, working in media. And I 
take that responsibility very seriously. I don't feel nearly smart enough. And so it's just like very prayerful work. Most of my prayers every day are, you know, God, please help, help me see clearly and help me articulate in such a way that, you know, there's a million words out there and there's so much content, but please help me articulate something that feels like it's somehow in a strange biblical language, but in a way that's sufficiently foreign to modern reductive ears that they're enchanted again back into seeing that the reality we can see and touch is not all there is, that there's like a broader meta narrative going on. So the short answer is it has like made my prayer life so much more frequent and desperate, this work (laughs) has, and it's made um, like, totally settling at a local church more recently, more complicated than I wish yeah. it were. <laughs> but but you see God working at work in your work and the people you work with. Well, it's a privilege, right? Yeah, 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 I do. I feel I have a wonderful sister who right out of college, she's a little younger than I was. She had to work for a big, big global bank and it was hard. It was like she had to get there at 3.30 a.m. And I think she often wouldn't leave until 12 hours or more later. And It was numbers and trading and computers. And she would say, you know, 22 years old, I just feel like all day this job, like I haven't thought about God once all day. And, you know, and I honor like all forms of work, you know, but I happen to be in this like very humane, meaning seeking. There's something in this gift I was given. I didn't start this publication, but it's just one that is trying to shine a light and illuminate what God may be up to. And I think there's something in that that, feels like so integrated with all that I am that I feel very lucky, like I'm living in my calling. And finally, what brings you joy in your faith life? I would say the two things that come to mind about joy, the first is music. Mm. I grew up a musician, and I think anytime I hear, whether it's Handel's Messiah or, frankly, even like The Sound of Silence by Simon and Carbuncle (laughs) or any sort of sacred piece of sacred music, I think I just, I'm just so grateful for the different cognition. There, There is like a sense of wonder at like the beauty and majesty of a God I am grateful to get to know, but feel I have very little understanding of mm. most of the time. Um, so that's one at a very sort of sensory level. And then the second is really like this experience yesterday being with a unlikely band of people on mission to try to be the hands and feet of Christ in their city. Uh, It's very real. Like they're dealing with like real pain and real loss and real trauma. And yet they are united in prayer and laughter and tears and concrete, like either educational experts there, you had economic development experts, you had police people, you had community shepherds. And I think when I'm, maybe this is just part of my particular vocation, but when I get to see communities of people that are inside the church, but are like out on the street, bringing God's kingdom on earth in some of the like hardest hit places, something about that just fills me with hope. And I think, okay, sometimes I wrestle with the words on the page or like theological hair splitting or whatever is going on in my particular writerly world. But this is like the real disease out here and in the best way, like these kind of cancer fighters and hope givers are presenting like God's wink to me that are at it for decades, long obedience, same direction. They fill me with hope and a confidence that like what I believe isn't just make-believe. That was Ann Snyder, editor-in-chief of Comment Magazine, talking with Steve. Something that I love that she said in this interview is that she illuminates what God may be up to. And I love that she says may be up to. Like she doesn't know for sure. None of us really know Mm. what God is doing as he orchestrates our lives, but we can point to the glimpses of light in this tumultuous world and say, I know it's scary and I know this world has a lot of darkness, but here are some things that are good and here are some things that I think God is doing. She repeatedly uses this phrase, 2,000 years of Christianity or 2,000 years of Christian thought. And I, you know, our tradition is a restorationist tradition. We're not the only ones. The evangelicals, the Pentecostals are also restorationists. This idea that all the good things got lost somewhere and we're the ones who have to bring them back. And for some reason, it became really comforting to me to think of this idea that no— Good people, 
have been using the gospel of Christ to struggle in this world and to build things in this world for 2,000 years. And we can look and see how they've been doing that and what were their successes. And and we can learn from them. And I just found that, oh, I needed to be reminded that God has been working in this world much longer than I've been around. (laughs) And he's loved other people as much as he's loved me. So this concept of public theology... That almost sounds un-American oh. because we're, we're <laughs> supposed to be like, uh, you have your belief, I have mine. We're not going to interfere with each other. But what is this public theology? And she really explains it, I think, over the course of the interview really well. When she talks about, well, what's the place of a church and what can they do in the community? And then she saw church people meeting with the local police force and like, wait a minute, that's secular. That's our government and what they can do to partner together, what role. I thought, how can I define this so I can hold on to it? And she said, all truth is God's truth. Yeah. I thought, okay, I can hold to the truth of how we can behave as a civil society and what we may believe religiously. Any truth of that, we can work together on. I also love this story that she gave about going to a youth group camp And having this transformative Christian experience, which I would just say all of you youth group leaders out there who feel like no one's paying attention and that all your work is for naught and (laughs) the kids didn't really care, you are changing lives and you are helping people access God in a way that they haven't before. And out of that experience for her comes this whole uh, work, this whole career of trying to connect other people to that. Yeah. Before I, I mentioned some phrases to look for, living her calling, that what she does actually is an expression of her faith. That's really cool when you can find some way to do that either in your life or in what you do after work. And finding kindred spirits, that's Lucy Maud Montgomery and Anne of Green Gables when Anne finds kindred spirits. This ended up being a really hopeful discussion with Anne for me because asking her what fills her with hope and she was able to enumerate several things and one of them was kindred spirits. If I've learned anything in hosting In Good Faith for years is when people talk to me about their personal faith journey, I feel like I'm finding kindred spirits. These are people who are who are sensing something more than just what we see in the world around us and and feel it moving in their lives. Many thanks to Ann Snyder for talking with us. This episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team also includes Leah King, Katarina Martinich, Josh Orton, and Ashton Rowan. Our post-production sound designers are Mark Hansen, Daniel Phillips, Lauren Sandberg, and Ashton Parkinson. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. So we're wondering at In Good Faith, as you listen, have you been motivated to have a conversation with someone outside your own faith tradition? Or have you paid attention maybe even to just what might be happening in a different congregation in your town? We'd love to know about it. Send us an email to ingoodfaith at byu.edu. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon right here in Good Faith.